welcome to our Tenebrae service here at Central Presbyterian Church. This year, done a little differently than is normal. Obviously, I'm speaking to you not from the chapel, and all of our speakers will be speaking to you not from the chapel this evening. But as we come to this evening's service, Maundy Thursday evening, we remember that this is Commandment Thursday, when Jesus gave a new commandment to his disciples on the night before he died, Jesus commanded them to love each other, to love each other as he had loved them. And so we remember that commandment as we gather and remember the story of Jesus from the Last Supper on Thursday evening through to his burial on Friday. The Tenebrae service actually is a pretty unique service in our worship tradition as Protestants. I mean, most Protestant worship has a tendency to be a celebration. It's filled with light, it's filled with color, it's filled with joy. But a Tenebrae service is really different. It focuses on this story of increasing darkness. And so the service itself, medieval in origin, is one in which the darkness keeps increasing until the end of the service, we have nothing on, no lights on, but simply a candle lit. And that's really unique for us. And yet it seems to me it's really an important service for us, maybe especially this year, because this has been a dark time, is a dark time. We have tried to get through it, humoring our way through our stay-at-home orders, and trying to reassure ourselves that most cases of COVID-19 are mild ones. Most people recover without any problems, we hope. We trust that will be the case for us if we get it and for those we love. But this is a dark time. And we know somewhere in our minds that a lot of people get sick. Even young and healthy people get sick. And there are people who are dying around us. And so the darkness. We don't have to imagine it. We don't have to make believe it. It's not something that just was 2,000 years ago, once and done. It's a darkness we're living through right now. And so, we invite you to this service of Tenebrae this year. I, I really don't know how you reproduce at home what we normally do here in the church on this service. How do you reproduce that gradual dimming of lights as the candles get snuffed out in your home? Then again, maybe you don't need to do that because maybe this year what comes to mind as this service unfolds are the pictures of the suffering you've seen and the stories of those who have gone through that suffering. And maybe that's darkness enough. Indeed, maybe this service means more this year than ever before. Because in this service of tenebrae, shadows, darkness, there is a reassurance that whenever we walk through dark times, we don't walk through them alone. But God walks through those times, through that darkness with us. And maybe this year, that's what we most need to know. That we're not alone, but God is walking with us through the dark. And maybe we will hear with new power, the promise, the hope of our faith.
that the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening, I'm John Cho. Uh, after sunset, Jesus and the twelve were sitting around the table. During the meal, Jesus said, I have something hard but important to say to you. One of you is going to hand me over to the conspirators. They were stunned and then began to ask one after another, It isn't me, is it, Master? Jesus answered, The one who hands me over is someone, or the ones who had that, the one who hands one who passes me food at the table. In one sense, the Son of Man is entering into a way of treachery well marked by the scriptures. No surprises here. In another sense, that man who turns him in turns straighter to the Son of Man. Better never to have born, been born than do this. Then Judas, already turned traitor, said, It isn't me, is it, Rabbi? Jesus said, Don't play games with me, Judas. Jesus said, before tonight is over, you are going to fall to pieces because of what happens to me. But the people said, even if everyone else falls into pieces on account of you, I won't. Jesus said, don't be so sure. Jesus said, this very night, before the rooster crows at the dawn, you will deny me three times. The people said, even if I have to die with you, I would never deny you. Jesus went, as he so often did, to the Mount of Olives. The disciples followed him, and when they arrived at the place, he said, Pray that you don't give in to temptation. He pulled away from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed, Father, remove this cup from me, but please, not what I want. What do you want? At once an angel from heaven was at his side. 
strengthening him. He prayed on all the harder. Sweat wrung from him like drops of blood poured off his face. He got up from prayer, went back to the disciples, and found them asleep, drugged by grief. He said, what business do you have sleeping? Get up. Pray so you won't give in to temptation. Judas showed up with a gang of ruffians sent by the high priests, religion scholars, and leaders, brandishing swords and clubs. The betrayer had worked out a signal with them. The one I kiss, that's the one. Seize him. Make sure he doesn't get away. He went straight to Jesus and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The others then grabbed him and roughed him up. One of the men standing there unsheathed his sword, swung, and came down on the chief's priest's servant, lopping off the man's ear. Jesus said to them, What is this, coming after me with swords and clubs as if I were a dangerous criminal? Day after day I have been sitting in the temple teaching, and you never so much as lifted a hand against me. What you in fact have done is confirm the prophetic writings. All the disciples cut and ran. A young man was following along. All he had on was a bed sheet. Some of the men grabbed him, but he got away, running off naked, leaving, the, leaving them holding the sheet. They led Jesus to the chief priest, where the high priest, religious leaders, and scholars had gathered together. Peter followed at a safe distance until they got to the chief priest's courtyard, where he mingled with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. The priest, conspiring with the Jewish council, looked high and low for evidence against Jesus, by which they could sentence him to death. They found nothing. Plenty of people were willing to bring in false charges, but nothing added up, and they ended up canceling each other out. Then a few of them stood up and lied. We heard him say, I am going to tear, tear down this temple built by hard labor and in three days build another without lifting a hand. But even they couldn't, ex couldn't agree exactly. In the middle of this, the chief priest stood up and asked Jesus, what do you have to say? What do you have to say to the accusation? Jesus was silent. He said nothing. J the chief priest tried again, this time asking, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed? Jesus said, yes, I am, and you'll see it yourself. The son of man seated at the right hand of the mighty one, arriving on the clouds of heaven. The chief priest lost his temper. Ripping off his clothes, he yelled, did you hear that? After that, do we need witnesses? You heard the blasphemy. Are you going to stand for it? They condemned him, one and all, the sentence, death. After they had finished nailing him to the cross and were waiting for him to die, they whiled away the time by throwing dice at his clothes. Above his head were the chargers against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Along with him, they crucified two other criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Along the way, they came on a man from Cyrene named Simon and made him carry Jesus' cross. Arriving at Golgotha, the place they called Skull Hill, they offered him a mild painkiller, a mixture of wine and myrrh. But when he tasted it, he wouldn't drink it. The soldiers assigned to the governor took Jesus into the governor's palace and got the entire brigade together for some fun. They stripped him and dressed him in a red toga. They plaited a crown from branches of a thorn bush and set it on his head. Then they put a stick on his right hand for a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mocking reverence. Bravo, king of the Jews, they said. Bravo. Then they spit on him and hit him on the head with a stick. When they had their fun, they took off the yoga and put his own clothes back on him. Then they proceeded to the crucifixion. By now it was noon, the whole earth became dark, the darkness lasting three hours, a total blackout. The temple curtain split right down the middle. Jesus called out loudly, Father, I place my life in your hands, and then he breathed his last. After all of this, Joseph of Arimathea, 
He was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he was intimidated by the Jews, petitioned Pilate to take the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission, so Joseph came and took the body. Nicodemus, who had first come to see Jesus at night, came now in broad daylight carrying a mixture of myrrh and aloe and 75 pounds. They took Jesus' body and, following the Jewish burial custom, wrapped it in a linen and with the spices. There was a garden near the place where he was crucified, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been placed yet. So, because it was Sabbath preparation for the Jews, and the tomb was convenient, they placed Jesus in it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 